Today I'm here with Russell Fazio, a social psychologist who's been heavily influential in research on attitudes, including their formation and influence on behavior. So that's mostly what we'll be talking about today. Uh, so I, hi, Dr. Fazio, thanks for coming on and talking with me today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. So I'm interested in getting into a little bit of context um, with you, just, just some of your background. What, what got you in, interested in psychology and going into social psychology research in the first place? Uh, interesting question and kind of a, a long story. Uh, I think like many people, I took my first psychology course thinking that I would probably be probably become a clinician of some sort, uh, desire to help people, that sort of thing. And um, I took a couple courses where I continued to hold that belief, but then I got, took my first course in social psychology where I had this brilliant instructor who really took a rather unique approach to the presentation of the material. It was essentially just describing one experiment after another. It was not so much here's what we know, but here's how we have come to know what we know. And uh, the course could easily have just been entitled you know, 100 Experiments in Social Psychology. <laughs> And I just love that. I, the, the thought that human social behavior could actually be studied experimentally, that was an insight to me and just so remarkable. And I thought the experiments themselves were so clever and just fascinating to see how you could engineer a situation in the lab that might actually mirror what goes on in the real world. So I got hooked um, by taking that course. And uh, even as an undergraduate, began to do some research with that particular professor and um, you know, found the research enterprise just to be a lot of fun to think about how you would operationalize an idea and actually test it. So that was the start of it all. And um, so I actually was involved in a couple projects that led to publications as an undergraduate and then moved on to my graduate career at Princeton and continued on that track for whatever, over 50 years now. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for you, it, it was always not only the information itself, but you were really interested in the nuts and bolts of the me methodology, methodology and research design and how you actually come to those findings. Very much so. It's just really intriguing to me. I, how could you how could you really test some theoretical idea that you had? How could you put it ultimately to a test in a laboratory? And that would mean, you know, how, how are you going to operationalize this idea? What are you even talking about with that concept? What is, what is it? Yeah. How do you break it apart? What's its fundamental nature? Uh, and yeah, that process was not only fun, but really engaging. How close is that process, or how close was that process then to how it is now? Like, how, how's that evolved over time? I, I'm sure, I'm sure that's that's a a loaded question, but I, I imagine that that there's some differences in in the way that that it worked. Well, there's no question that the field has changed over my time doing social psychology. So, uh, th there was a time when the field place much more emphasis on really involving laboratory situations that sometimes was associated with the use of deception, which had yeah. its pros and its cons. Um, but, um, you know, I think in those days, we are much more, our, our goal was much more to create for the participant a really involving situation in the laboratory one that really did mimic the real world. I think as a field, we've moved away from that. We still do that kind of laboratory research, but it's less common. We do much more research now online using online platforms like Amazon MTurk and Prolific. But there's still that element of, even in an online survey of how are you going to manipulate that variable? How are you going to yeah. keep people involved 
in the experiment and not just blow it off? <laughs> How are you going to get people to really understand the questions that you're asking of them, the decisions that you're asking them to make? So although the field certainly has changed, that aspect is really quite constant. Yeah. How do you think that the online method compares to a more in-person environmental design method where, you know, I imagine it would reduce friction and then increase the scale quite a bit, but it seems like, like it would be much more difficult to, to tweak the environmental factors and fine tune those. Yeah, I think that's very much correct. Um, obviously online, you have much less impact. Um, you really can't have truly impactful manipulations like you can in person. So that's a downside. The The upside is that you can ha collect data from f many, many more participants, yeah. at far, far less cost. So you have uh, an increase in your power due to just sample size, but right. a decrease in your power because you're, you really can't do very impactful manipulations. And I think the key to doing good online research is it's still to find ways to engage the participant and make your manipulations as impactful as possible. Yeah. So, so for example, I had a postdoc a couple of years ago who was very clever at, at doing that sort of things and also had the software skills to do it. So there's a, there's a common paradigm. You may have read about it. Um, called the minimal group paradigm, whereby you try to, in the laboratory, it's really quite easy to get to assign the person randomly to a group, but simply by being a member of that group, all sorts of biases start to emerge. Yeah. Um, just because this is my in-group, these are my people. Yeah. Those people are, they're the out-group. Um, and in the laboratory, that's often done by just, for example, assigning people to a red team or a blue team. You might put out red t-shirts or, 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 or blue t-shirts, or they might go through um, a procedure where they are presented with dots on the screen and they have to estimate how many dots there are. Oh, you know, it turns out you, you're, you're an overestimator. So you're a member of that group. These other people are the underestimators. Now, in the laboratory, that can be quite impactful, but how do you do that online? Right. Well, this postdoc came up with a really clever way of doing it. He mimicked an actual coin flip. So you saw the coin actually flipping through the air, and it, you were told if it came out heads, you're on the red team. If it comes out tails, you're on the blue team. But once that happened, say it came out heads, okay, you're on the red team. Well, now you had to, with your mouse, grab hold of an avatar that represented you and move you into this box that was labeled red team. Okay, so now it's a lot more impact, impactful. Yeah. And I think that's really a key to doing online research, coming up with ways to make your manipulation salient so that you're not just administering a questionnaire. Now, right. that's valuable too. And a lot of times we've done that as well, where in that case, you just wanna have very clear questions that are engaging, but. Is it kind of a mess trying to, trying to control for like people not caring or kind of just flipping through the survey, especially like if it's going out to so many people, my understanding is that a lot of that's college students you know, but maybe they have some kind of financial incentive. But we learned a little bit about that in research methods about how you have to control for people like giving the same kind of answer over and over again. What, what's that like trying to trying to keep that under control? Yeah. Ideally, you've engaged the participant enough and they understand the value of the research that they're going to be cooperative and yeah. um, not just rush through um, the, the survey, rush through the questions, but really um, give things some thought. But what you're alluding to is indeed an issue. And so what researchers often do is include uh, what they call attention checks in the procedure. Um, and those attention checks are meant to basically catch the kind of person who really isn't paying attention. 
So it could be something as simple as, you know, here's a question. If you're reading this, select option C. <laughs> Uh, and if somebody doesn't do that, well, come on. <laughs> Just throw them out. Just throw them. <laughs> but, you know, you want to minimize the number of people you exclude. So it's best right. not to, to, to have to do that. And the way to get around the problem is to make sure that the participant is engaged, sees that you're doing something valuable, and that you maintain the person's interest throughout the length of the survey. Um, Online, it's much, much more difficult to do surveys that take 20, 30 minutes than it would be in person. For you, like going to the, the in-group and out-group stuff, for you, is, is that interesting to see out in the wild, like you're watching sports or, you know, like you have the World Cup, which is a pretty extreme example, or, or just, just even sports in the United States, like watching people get so attached to Super Bowls coming up, just... It's, it's it's kind of interesting to me, and I'm I'm nowhere near as knowledgeable on this stuff as you are, but it's it's kind of fun to like watch people like battle over their tribe. It, of course, that can get dark in, in in more serious circumstances, but in sports, it's kind of a funny one to watch. Yeah, I think sports fans are uh, in many ways show you some of the fundamental processes, some fundamental biases <laughs> that we all are are prone to. So, you know, my team never commits the foul. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, it wasn't my basketball player who uh, charged. <laughs> yeah, it was a block. Come on. <laughs> um, and you know, so sports fans are sometimes aware that oh, okay, maybe my judgment might be biased. You know, if you really pin them down, they're willing to say, okay, maybe I'm wrong. But other times, you know, they're convinced. This, that's what I saw. Those are my eyes. That's what I saw. And so what you're pointing to is, I think, a really interesting continuum. I often talk about it in my um, attitudes course, where I argue that attitudes bias judgments, uh, but they also bias perceptions. Yeah. And what is the difference between a perception and a judgment? Where along that continuum are we? Are we at any given moment in time? And it's often the case that we actually are making a judgment, but for us, it feels like a perception. We saw it, not recognizing that what we see can actually be affected by what we bring into the situation, by our own stereotypes, our own attitudes, our own beliefs, our expectations, all of that can actually affect what we quote see. Mm -hmm. But for us, we don't recognize that we played a role in that perceptual process. So it doesn't feel like a judgment, it feels like a perception. So yeah. it's a really interesting dichotomy. And I think you see it play out in sports fans very, very often. The the judgment's so fast that it, it feels like, like that just the information that you're actually getting, but really you're just making such an instantaneous judgment that you don't even realize it. Right. You don't realize that even though it was such an instantaneous process, you and your biases could have affected the perceptual outcome. Yeah, we we have a we have a pretty uh, funny case study of that. Just us being at Ohio State, we've got we've got a heck of a tribe in our football fan base. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, so, so going into um, into attitudes, just to start super basic, super simple. How how do you define attitude? Um, for for me, an attitude is nothing more than an evaluation. So it's a sense of positivity, negativity, favorability, like dislike. Very very simple. I I like. I prefer to keep the definition very simple. Because then we not we're not making any assumptions regarding the concept. Instead, we're yeah. asking, are there correlates? Are there consequences to this simple construct? Uh, but for me, it's yeah, simply a like and a di or a dislike. Um, you know, I think attitude as a 
concept in psychology has a history to it, um, whereas for the lay public, attitude can mean a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, you know, we often talk about somebody having an attitude. <laughs> you know, uh, a statue, piece of art can have an attitude, its posture. And that that's all linked historically to the concept of attitude in social psychology. But in, in, in many ways, I think the, the term that uh, is used in the lay public more often is simply opinion. And that, that's what I mean, a like and a dislike, an opinion. Um, that, that's really how I think about uh, the attitude concept. Historically, in, in social psychology, attitude and opinion mean slightly different things. Opinion is the verbal expression of an attitude. Um, so we had reason as researchers to offer that distinction. But I, I think for the general public, when we talk about an attitude, we're talking about opinion. So we're just we're constantly kind of breaking things up and setting up A's and B's. I like like here's the thing, like or dislike, we're just kind of throwing it in those buckets. That's a good way to put it. And that that I've always argued is incredibly functional to do. Right. You want to categorize your world into good and bad, things that you want to approach, things that you want to avoid. Yeah. And the better sense you have of those categories, the easier your life is. You don't have to deliberate. You don't have to think. <laughs> but if the attitude, the like or dislike comes to mind very quickly, very automatically, without your having to reflect on it, you can make snap judgments yeah. on whether to approach or, or avoid something. And that means you can save your cognitive resources, your energy for things that matter. Right. So it's an incredibly functional uh, construct. Because uh, otherwise you would just be drowned in complexity all the time and like you wouldn't be able to navigate anything. Because yes, there's, there's just there's just too much wondering what do I do? What do I do? How do I yeah. decide? Oh, look at this thing. It's got this positive feature, this positive feature. Oh, but it's also got X, Y and Z, which are negative. How do I put all that together? And, you know, by the time you've done that, the bear has eaten you. Uh, right. You just cannot go through life constantly having to analyze and uh, engage in this kind of cognitive algebra by which you think of positives and negative features and summate them somehow into some judgment. That, that'd be so difficult to walk down the street right. and do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I took um, the judgment decision-making class last semester and it, our, my, my professor did a really good job of, of uh, highlighting the, the value of heuristics because often it's like they, 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 they're kind of frowned upon, but it's, they're, they're really kind of necessary. And it, it, the, the research was interesting in how often they're actually correct as opposed to using like more complex methods, which I, I thought was fascinating that, that, that these yeah, snap judgments can be better. We don't develop shortcuts because they don't work for us. <laughs> they right. work more often than not. Yeah. Um, and um, knowing your likes and dislikes works for, for you more often than not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could lead you astray. So maybe, maybe this thing that you um, like has actually changed over time. Um, or, I mean, let's take a food. You generally like a certain kind of, a certain entree at a restaurant. But unfortunately, this chef has prepared it in a very unusual fashion. <laughs> so your decision to approach could actually lead to, a, for what you, for for what it what is for you, a negative outcome. So right. in that sense, the le attitude led you astray. Yeah. But more often than not, <laughs> It's going to lead you in the right direction and and allow you to make decisions without having to deliberate. Yeah. So uh, helpful for the most part, so long as you don't cling to them too rigidly when things change, like you have to let them be fluid and flexible a little bit to like align more with the fact that things change in reality. Yep. Uh, what are some of the things that influence the way that they're developed? Oh, attitudes can develop in any number of ways, unquestionably. Uh, you know, and sometimes we are indeed very rational creatures. 
and we reason about the uh, the pros and cons, the costs and the benefits, uh, to arrive at some some ultimate evaluation of some attitude. But that's not the only way attitudes form. Sometimes we develop our attitudes in far less rational processes. Mm -hmm. So um, simply as a function of the emotions that something might evoke in us, we can develop positivity or negativity um, simply because we find ourselves usually behaving in certain ways we may infer, oh, I must really like this. You know, every time I go buy that particular candy machine, what I tend to buy is a Snickers. Okay, <laughs> I guess I must really like Snickers. Uh, so sometimes we engage in that kind of behavioral observation. But, uh, you know, a lot of times it's just observation of other people. Uh, so, for example, you know, a child can easily develop a, um, a a fear, an apprehension of uh, a swimming pool because they see how anxious their mother is <laughs> about their behavior around a swimming pool. And so that kind of observational learning can lead to the development of, uh, of fears or negative attitudes. Uh, so there's a ton of ways in which attitudes can develop. Uh, some of them are very, very simplistic. One process that I've spent some time studying is what we call evaluative conditioning. So sometimes objects that could be brands, for example, are just regularly paired with other positive objects. So there is a process by which the positivity that's associated with something that is presented at the same time as this novel object can actually transfer to that novel object. And as a result of that mere association, mm -hmm. that object can begin to acquire some positivity. So, so that, that's a process we've spent some time studying. So there, there's many, many ways then in which attitudes can be formed. Some of it is just basic socialization as well. We learn from our parents, we learn from our friends. Yeah. And what they tell us has a big influence on the attitudes that we develop. Yeah, how much do we overweight direct experience or personal experience as opposed to um, broader statistical probabilities? Um, that's a very good question. and. Um, I've actually, early in my career, I spent a lot of time studying attitude formation through direct experience versus what we called indirect experience. So indirect experience is when somebody tells you about some object, you read about it, you're, you're getting information from some other source. And on that basis of that information, forming evaluations, forming likes and dislikes. Direct experience is when you actually interact with the object and so you're experiencing it so for example um, you, you can imagine a situation where we've got various kinds of novel puzzles this is a paradigm we actually used in the laboratory presenting people with various kinds of puzzles and in one condition people are exposed to the puzzles by just giving them time to interact with samples of each one. So they get to experience, and you know, this one, this kind is a little bit boring. Th this kind, well, these kind of insight problems, wow, that's kind of engaging, and they develop, say, a like for it. But they develop likes and dislikes by noting their actual experiences as they interact with each puzzle. In contrast, you can, in another condition, present people with the very same sample puzzle pages, but the answers are already there. And you just describe to the participant how that puzzle works. Well, certainly they get a sense of what the puzzle's like, but it's not the same. They're imagining whether they might like or dislike. 
And that can be quite different than the feelings that they might have when they actually work the puzzle, potentially are frustrated, potentially find out that, oh, I got that right away, whatever. So um, what, what, what we have found invariably is that attitudes based upon direct experience are stronger. And, and what I mean by stronger is that number one, they're more likely to affect later behavior. So if you now place that participant in a situation where they've got 15 minutes to play with any of the puzzles that they want for as long as they want, uh, they could start with letter series and work that and then jump to a different kind of puzzle near a point, uh, then jump to a different kind of puzzle, get all completion, whatever we're going to present them with. But it's entirely up to them. They've got 15 minutes to do whatever they like. What you find is that people who form their attitudes through direct experience, and you then after that experience, you ask them for the ratings of how interesting they find each of the puzzle types. Their free play behavior is much more a function of what they described as the interest value of each of those five types of you find far less of that in the indirect experience condition where mm -hmm. people were just told about the puzzles, then they rate their interest value. But now what's happening is they're sampling a puzzle and discovering, for example, oh, that wasn't as much, as much fun as I thought it would be. I'm going to move on. They don't play, play with it as much as they would otherwise. The uh, attitudes based upon direct experience are also, we know, help with more confidence. People will say that they're more confident about their attitudes. But probably the key property, the one that we in our research program focused on the most, and proved to be the most fruitful, is what we call the accessibility of the attitude. How accessible is it for memory? So sometimes when we form attitudes, we form such a strong association between the object and our evaluation of that object that, that that association is so strong that whenever we see that attitude object, we can't help but have the evaluation come to mind. It just kind of pops into our head mm -hmm. automatically without our thinking about it, inescapably, in fact. And um, that kind of automatic attitude activation is much more likely to be a consequence of attitude formation through direct experience than attitude formation through indirect experience. So we spent a lot of many years studying this concept of attitude accessibility. Um, it, in, in some ways, it's, it's not different than other kinds of strong associations that we develop. Yeah. Yeah, so so if I say bacon to you, you got to think of eggs, right? Salt. You <laughs> my first, to, <laughs> right? It, it's just those are so strongly associated. Well, the same can be true of an attitude object. So one of the examples I often give is anchovies, and for some people, anchovies just produces this incredible yuck reaction, right? Immediate <laughs> yuck. I happen to love anchovies, but so does my dad. My 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 first thought was pizza because of that. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> but we develop these strong associations, and those associations sometimes are evaluative in nature. And when they're evaluative in nature, we call them an attitude. <laughs> uh, and some of our attitudes really have that kind of a strong property to them, so they're highly ex accessible for memory. Other attitudes, you know, we got to think a bit more. We've got to reflect got to think what maybe even think what do I know about that and form the attitude from scratch so attitudes vary along that kind of continuum of attitude accessibility and the more accessible the attitude is the more likely it is that it's going to have an impact bias our perceptions bias our judgments influence our behavior etc so the the more easily the attitude is brought to your conscious mind, the more influential it is on your on your behavior. Yes. 
so what what's the the impact of of unconscious need, attitudes let me, let me amend that it need not be brought to mind to the point of consciousness okay okay it need not be even something that people are aware that the attitude okay. has been activated but simply having that positivity or or negativity be more accessible in memory got, kind of gotten a kick in the pants is enough for that positivity to now serve as a lens through which you're viewing that object in that moment in time and hence you're more likely to construe it to be positive yes yeah, so, okay so yeah because my, my question was, was going to be on the the impact of of unconscious attitudes because I, cause I, I, was, I was curious about about that part so you don't have to necessarily like be able to articulate it or be aware of it in order for it to have that kind of an impact. Yes. Um, you can be unconscious, unaware that your attitude is affecting your perceptions, affecting your uh, judgments. You certainly can be unaware of the bias, the influence of the attitude. I, I don't like the term unconscious attitude because it implies that people aren't aware that they have the attitude and there's there's really no evidence for that okay <laughs> that people you press them enough eventually it'll come out situation well enough they will admit that they have <laughs> a particular like or dislike now sometimes people don't want to reveal that because of social sure. desirability concerns but i that doesn't mean people are unaware of their attitude they just rather not reveal their attitude those are very very different kinds of notions yeah it, it seems like the weight towards direct experience can can be an issue though like if if you run into somebody i mean this it, it seems like like this would tie into stereotyping like if you run into somebody and th they they do something that, that you don't like and then and then you generalize it or even you know you see um a, a bad p police reaction and now you know all cops are bad like you're 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 fighting against a, it seems like what a, like a more broad reality is and that that can be pretty damaging what, what are some ways to to i guess push back against that bias that we have towards our own personal experience it's actually quite difficult to do that because i think people value those kinds of experiences to such a degree they regard them as very diagnostic uh, they, they reveal something about themselves so it, it can be difficult um you know i i think what you try to do is restrict the generalization so this was an instance of an experience with one particular individual right Let's generalize from that individual to a broader class it's that issue of generalization that is potentially so problematic. Mm -hmm. could, could you explain the, the mode model? Oh, sure. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, we did a lot of work early in my career on this concept of attitude behavior consistency. So we were interested in how tied is later behavior to what people have told us their likes and dislikes are? Um, and we got interested in that question because there was, at the time that I entered the field, some strong skepticism about the extent to which attitudes were predictive of, of later behavior. And uh, so some of the early work I did was intended to address this question of attitude behavior consistency. So we looked at attitudes formed through direct experience versus indirect experience. We looked at um, attitudes that were held confidently versus not. We eventually looked at attitudes that were ex more or less accessible in memory. So we ended up knowing that certain kinds of attitudes seem to be more impactful than other kinds of attitudes but we really didn't know too much about the 
process by which attitudes guide behavior. And when we began to think about that, we eventually arrived at the mode model. But the, the, the essence of that model is that there are different pathways by which attitudes can have an influence upon our behavior, upon our judgments or behavior. One pathway is a relatively spontaneous one where people don't actually reflect much upon the decision process. And attitudes could affect behavior in those kinds of spontaneous manners in situations where mere observation of the attitude object automatically automatically activates the attitude from memory. So I'm walking down the street. I see somebody that I really dislike. That dislike pops into my mind automatically. That negativity gets activated. And now I'm particularly noticing that this person seems threatening, um, whatever it might be. And I walk to the other side of the street. Okay, so my construal of the person in that immediate situation was that this person was threatening. That construal, that perception, was affected by my automatically activated attitude. I didn't really deliberate. I didn't reflect back upon what I know about this person, etc. It just happened more or less automatically as a function of this negative association that I have toward that person being automatically activated. That is a very spontaneous route by which attitudes can affect behavior. Doesn't require any effort on our part. On the other hand, sometimes we engage in much more deliberative decision making where we actually analyze the pros and the cons and our attitudes influence that process, but we're engaging in some kind of deliberation. We're putting forth effort, we're reflecting. The mode model was an attempt to integrate the spontaneous process and the more deliberative process. So mode is actually an acronym for motivation and opportunity as determinants of the attitude behavior process. And the idea is that unless we're really motivated to do so, we're not going to put forth the effort to deliberate. There's, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be something about the nature of the decision that makes us willing to put in the effort. Mm -hmm. So when motivation is low, we're more likely to rely upon this spontaneous attitude to behavior process. Likewise, sometimes we might be motivated to deliberate, but whoa, I just don't have the opportunity. I don't, I don't have the time. You're, making yeah. it, you're asking me for a quick decision or I might be motivated, but my gosh, I'm really tired today. <laughs> I just don't have the emotional energy, the resources to put forth that kind of effort. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't have the opportunity. Well, when you don't have the opportunity, then you're particularly likely to just rely upon what gets automatically activated. And that spontaneous attitude behavior process is what will prevail. It's when you have both motivation and opportunity that you might do something quite different. And in fact, what you could do even if you have a strong association that's automatically activated, is start deliberating about that association, deliberating about that evaluation. Wait a minute. Is it really right of me to have that thought in this situation? Is it really mm -hmm. right of me to assume that this person is going to be threatening? And people could try to analyze their automatically activated evaluation, their attitude and consider other possibilities. They might be motivated to think about other characteristics of the person, whatever it might be, and actually counter the influence of their automatically activated attitude. But that requires 
motivation and opportunity. You've, you've got to have both of those ingredients to counter the influence of the automatically activated attitude. Yeah, it, it seems well, like that. of the model. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems like th that kind of explains partially why why social interaction can be so tough tough because you mentioned um or before the the impact of emotions on attitudes and social interactions tend to be to have a an ability to be pretty emotionally arousing but you also have very little time to think like if it's an in-person reaction like you you don't have time to like take a step back and like think it through really yeah i think that's a very good observation that if if we Imagine what our life would be like if we had to reflect, deliberate effortly every time we choose to begin a conversation with somebody, every time we choose to end a conversation with somebody, or, or even, you know, am I going to change the topic of conversation now? My gosh, we would, we would just be overwhelmed. Right. Um, we, we would not be capable of interaction. So we, we have to engage in behavior simply as a function of the controls that we have in any given situation, what we what we perceive is going on. Mm -hmm. And it's the fact that attitudes can bias those perceptions, those controls that can lead to an effective attitude on our behavior without our even realizing it's happening. Yeah. What are some ways to better bring some of those things to your attention so that you can I guess, play with them a little bit more deliberately and think through them better so you're not too too ruled by things that like that you, you don't want to be ruled by? Well, I think that that motivation has to be evoked. That, that's that's the first step. So the more consequential the decision is, the more likely people will be to put the effort in to engage in a cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I've got to, if I've got to decide whether to spend thirty, forty thousand dollars on a particular automobile, well, <laughs> uh, let's get beyond my automatically activated likes and dislikes. Yeah. Let, let's develop some evidence <laughs> for that uh, beyond the fact that I just happen to like something or, or dislike a car, whatever it might be. Um, so how consequential the decision is a very important. Other domains that are critical are ones where uh, there are norms, either personal norms or societal norms that one wants to abide by. So I think interracial uh, interactions can be especially ones where people might be motivated because they recognize it as a situation where they could be influenced by a negative stereotype, could be influenced by automatically activated negativity. And as long as they see this as a decision context that is race related, then assuming they're motivated to be egalitarian, that motivation might get evoked. Mm -hmm. But that requires recognizing the situation as one that is potentially relevant to racial attitudes. Yeah. So I think that's a context where if you can get people to recognize that this is a situation that is race related, then you might do what you were suggesting, actually push people toward a more motivated, deliberative process away from a more automatic, spontaneous process. Yeah, I, I think the motivation point is really important because it, there's a lot of like, you know, tips and tricks and hacks for different things that are talked about, but it seems like it's less talked about th that you, you have to really actually want to do it in order for it to be effective, in order for some kind of change to be had. How much does outlining the consequences of something or the impacts of something influence the motivation because that, that's that's something that I, well, I found at least for me anytime that i've been able to do that it's like oh i i didn't think about how this was going to affect that and then that that will 
change the the importance that I give to a specific thing. Yeah, I, th I think you're right that you can people can develop cues that um, some course of action, uh, some class of people, whatever, are consequential, and then once those cues themselves get activated, they can, that can serve to evoke the motivation. Yeah, so something's got to happen, and it's often mm -hmm. the case that realizing that this is a setting in which action is consequential for you, for others, yeah, that can lead people to recognize, wait, this is a setting where one should be more effortful, more contemplative. Yeah. So what research have you been interested in doing recently? What What's coming up for you? Um, well, we, we spent, as I said, 50 years studying attitudes, formation, how the rep, how attitudes are represented in memory, how they're activated from memory, the consequences that that can have for perception, judgment, and behavior. Um, what happened recently was actually the pandemic. Yeah. COVID. And uh, when the pandemic broke, my lab group and I actually had a meeting where we were talking about um, the fact that the entire society had been told to engage in social distancing. Okay, so how rare that is. Yeah. An entire society is basically given a directive to change their behavior in a particular way. <laughs> Engage in social distancing. Stay six feet away from everybody else. Um, so uh, my lab group actually began to think about that question of who would comply with social distancing directive and why? Yeah. And what kind of beliefs so we're back to attitudes and beliefs. Right. What kinds of attitudes and beliefs would be predictive of taking the social distancing directive seriously, trying to, in fact, follow that kind of directive, uh, and ultimately possibly be predictive of whether people actually contracted COVID or not. <laughs> um, so we actually dropped everything we were doing in terms of the laboratory work because we couldn't go into our laboratory anyways. That was shut down yeah. um, and began a, a, a series of online studies where we studied social distancing and the beliefs that were predictive of social distancing behavior. Um, ironically, what came out of that are two lines of worse research that we continue to study to this day, and they're they're actually very closely related to attitudes and beliefs, conspiracy theories, and misinformation. So, um, to back up a little bit, we took a unique approach to um, studying social distancing. What was very common and survey research was to simply ask people a question, to what extent are you complying with the CDC recommendation to en engage in social distancing? Parenth parenthetically, stay six feet away from others. That, that was a question that was used in many, many surveys. We included it in our work but we were actually a little, not a little, very much concerned about how people would respond to that question. And our concerns were, number one, social desirability. So right. they just want to present themselves in that way. But more importantly, if you think about that question, and if somebody's really taking it seriously, wow, what? think about what you're asking them to do. <laughs> They've got to think back to their past behavior and how often they've in fact made an effort to stay away from other people and they've got to reconstruct their memories. Then they've got to match those memories 
to the scale that you presented them with, am I very strictly adhering, somewhat adhering, so on? That That's asking a lot right. of an individual. So we thought that there were many reasons to believe that those reports could be biased. And in fact, they could be biased by reconstructive memory processes. So if I happen to be a kind of person, let's say, who believes myself to be a very compassionate individual, I really care about others. I, I don't want them to get COVID. Well, that belief about myself biases this reconstruction of my past behavior. <laughs> Of course I did that kind of thing. <laughs> and so there's many variables that go into that reconstructive memory process. So what we wanted to do was come up with different ways of measuring social uh, social distancing behavior. And we arrived at uh, what we called virtual social distancing behaviors. So we would present people with a concrete situation on their screen, on their computer screen. So here you are at a crosswalk Use your mouse to tell me how much distance you want between yourself and this other passerby who's coming at you. So use your mouse to distance yourself. How far away would you be from that person? And we measured that. So people is making a concrete in the moment decision that mimics what happens in the real world. Mm -hmm. Or we presented them with a graphic image of a park. They've got to get to the other side of the park. There's one route that's a very direct route, but there's clearly people there. There's another route that's much more isolated, but it's much more indirect. You're going to have to walk farther. Which would you choose? So we had 10 different scenes like that, where people were, in each case, making a concrete in the moment decision. So we could get an estimate of their social distancing behavior from the decisions that they made in these virtual situations. And that, that turned out to be fascinating. It was somewhat related to people's self-reports of their social distancing behavior. But in this longitudinal work that we were doing, we actually contacted people four months after our initial survey and asked whether they had uh, contracted COVID during those four months, and they tested positively. Turned out that our virtual social distancing behaviors did a much better job of predicting whether people contracted COVID than that self-report measure did. That makes, yeah. And, and the argument is that that self-report measure is in fact biased by this reconstructive memory process. And indeed, we found many, many variables that affected that self-report. For example, um, people's political affiliations, their orientation, um, people who were very much supportive of Donald Trump at the time, didn't think the um, uh, pandemic was all that serious. Right. They, um, yet they still reported engaging in social distancing, uh, possibly because they were also a compassionate person, say. Um, there were many variables that we found to affect the self-report. Um, obviously, the more seriously someone thought the pandemic was, the more they inflated the extent to which they reported engaging in social distancing behavior, so that um, the, these beliefs about the pandemic and beliefs about what kind of person they themselves were actually had different effects on virtual social distancing behavior versus self-reported social distancing behavior. And ultimately, that led to differences with respect to the extent to which in the real world people were protecting themselves from contracting the virus or not. Yeah. Yeah. I I imagine there's going to be a lot of interesting research, especially in, in your field coming out of coming out of the pandemic moving forward. Yeah. So w one of the variables that turned out to be really critical was just people's beliefs about COVID. Yeah. We actually had a little true false test 
um, because there was a lot of misinformation being spread around at the time. So did people believe some of that false information? Did they not believe some of the true information about COVID? And it turned out that people's knowledge about COVID was very strongly predictive of their social distancing behavior virtually. Mm -hmm. So if they had more accurate knowledge, they were more likely to actually, in our virtual situations, distance themselves from other people. If they believed misinformation, they were less likely to do that. And that then was a predictor of whether they would contract COVID. So that's gotten us very interested in misinformation, and we're now doing work on it. Um, so that's just, yeah, that's just one example of exactly what you were suggesting, that out of the pandemic come some really interesting research questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me today. It's, 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 been, a, it's been a pleasure to talk about this stuff with you. So I, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.